Good afternoon, everyone. We, we, have a, we have a tight schedule today, and I'm going to try to get started quickly. I'm Dan Stork, the, the chair for the Environment Committee, and I, I asked all of our audience members, thank you all very much for coming, but if we could please um, uh, keep your t comments tight and, and uh, brief and focused, and we have, uh, again, many, many more things to do today. We, we are now going to move towards the, uh, the Lake Akatink uh, a dredging issue and portion of that, and we have Chris Harrington and Charles Smith are here to present. And with that, I will turn it over to you, two gentlemen. Thank you, uh, Chairman McKay, Supervisor Stork, and members of the board. I just wanted to give you an overview of our um, the report out, basically from what we were charged to do in terms of seeking to establish a dredging program for Lake Akatink. Uh, to give a so that went, went one too many. There we go. Um, just to give a quick overview a reminder, Lake Akatink Park is a very valued resource by the community. It's, uh, it's it serves a tremendous number of people in the communities around the lake, um, and there are, it's a very diverse community that serves in that area. Uh, although it lies in the Braddock District, it also uh, has its entrance through Franconia District, and it touches on Mason District and also Springfield. So it, it touches a lot of districts within the county. Uh, there's an, there's 250,000 uh, visitors per year, and that's by count, but that doesn't really necessarily account for the many other people who arrive to the many entrances to that park. Um, it al is also, uh, just to remind you that there was a significant community engagement effort by the Park Authority starting in 2016, extending through 2019, to basically look at, it started with a master plan revision process, but it was quickly realized that they need, we needed to figure out how to manage the lake itself. And the outcome of that process is what we're here to talk, talk a bit about today. Uh, it was decided to establish a dredge, dredge program with some very basic goals, to establish an average depth of eight feet and implement a maintenance dredging program. Uh, in addition, the, the goal was to establish a lake that was to serve aesthetic and recreational uh, as an as aesthetic and recreational resource for the community. The two links we have at the bottom of the slide are the same two that Chris sent out to you in an email on April 11th. It just tells our story map and project web page. So the timeline, as I mentioned, was 2016 through 19 with significant community engagement. At the end of that process, there was a recommendation to dredge the lake. The, there was a presentation to, to the board in October of 29 to the budget committee, and there was an approval for the financing plan for the lake for the dredge program, excuse me. Uh, and then we came for our first approval for seeking a loan from the state, from the Virginia Clean Water Revolving Loan Fund in June of 2020. That fall, we hired our vendor, Arcadis, and began the study design. Um, then we went through a significant intensive period starting in September 2020, which involved community outreach, significant number of uh, investigative processes to look at alternatives for dredging, uh, and, and community stakeholder engagement. And during that same cycle, we came back in July of 21 to ask for permission to seek an additional $30 million in loans. So we would already knew by that point that we were climbing in price. We weren't sure how far that was going to go, but at that point we, we stuck with the 30 additional million. Uh, and then at the conclusion of our process, we had realized, or as we got through it in later 2022, that that number was climbing significantly. Um, we finally reported out to the community in February, so we, we published a, a story map which talked about what we are finding in terms of our costs and our recommendations as staff. We then had held two public meetings and went through a public survey and comment period, which concluded on April 1st. So just to go over cap or review what the dredge program would in, require, it would require establishing a dewatering site not at the lake. There's no room near Lake Akatank, so it would have to be pumped via pipeline to a dewatering site, which would be cleared. And that from the dredge program would take place at the lake itself, be pumped to the dewatering site where the dredge spoils would be uh, drained of their fluid. They'd have to then be trucked to a disposal site. Uh, we estimated it would take 500,000 cubic yards of dredging, which is about 50,000 trucks over a three-year period. And then we'd have to return <coughs> once every five years to redredge it to maintain the depth of the lake to meet the established project goals, which required about 15,000 trucks in a one-year period every five years in order to accomplish a maintenance dredge. So evaluating the options, we went through a really extensive process. And I think the key is uh, that the project team uh, identified alternatives. We reached out to the public and communicated those. We got a lot of suggestions from both the stakeholders and the community at large. We also reevaluated re those. So we looked at 19 potential disposal or dredge spoil reprocessing sites, 
seven pipeline alignments, and we looked at um, somewhere in the neighborhood, I think it was uh, nine spoils disposal options, including beneficial reuse and disposal on, on county property. The, when we came up with our final numbers based on where we thought was actually viable, uh, we came up with the, a base dredge total of about $95 million. We also knew it was our charge to establish a, a maintenance dredging program and be able to come back and report out to this board what that would cost. We, when we inflated those costs over four dredge cycles in a 20-year period after the post, after the main dredge, we are close to $300 million for maintenance dredging in a 20-year period. So the total for 25 years of dredging is about $400 million. So the drivers for this included doing additional bathymetric surveys and finding out the lake had accumulated additional sediment from 2016 to 2021. We also realized that when you empty the lake, it becomes more efficient at capturing the sediment that's coming to it. So over the three-year dredge cycle, you have to over-dredge by 100,000 cubic yards just to meet your eight-foot depth requirement. So that drives you up to that 500,000 cubic yards or a 43% increase. We have much higher processing costs than originally anticipated, and that's just based on current market rates and uh, the current industry standards. Um, there was also the tri higher trucking and disposal costs. There were some assumptions made that we no longer consider valid in the original concept. Uh, we could not find a low cost or, in, or no cost disposal site. And the cheapest would be to basically take it to a quarry in the western part of the county at Luxstone and deposit it there. We have a, a fixed rate for deposit fees. Um, the, the frequent maintenance dredging would also, is also a significant factor. And also inflation. Inflation has gone up, obviously, and so our CPI uh, went up to about 5%, and that's what we used it to inflate our costs, which that is the normal process for the county for all large projects, is to inflate outward to the midpoint of construction. So when we looked at those out-year costs, those are based on the normal inflation process. So the big things we wanted to, to really emphasize to help look for ourselves and, and to communicate to others as to why these costs went up. If you look on the left, you're seeing what were the assumptions that were made in the original concept, the $30.5 million dredge program. And you'll see that there were um, the assumptions made as we, just, we talked before about the quantity, which was now considered to be quite low compared to what we know to be the truth now, the number. We also look at the disposal options and why we went from an assumption of low cost to the fact that we have hard numbers now on the actual disposal site and current trucking numbers. There was also some assumptions made about being able to use the power lines in Wakefield Park, which we know from talking to Dominion Electric extensively and analyzing the available space under their lines that we cannot meet production rates by using that site. So therefore, we had to pick another site, which would have environmental impacts, and we'd have to clear it to make a pad site. Uh, also within Wakefield Park is what we, we think is the most um, viable option. And then at the bottom there is the, the issue of maintenance dredging and that um, the, the $300 million cost over time, and that's how we programmed it in. So those are the primary differences between the original concept and the current understanding. So as we began to see these costs go up, we thought we should do our due diligence and look at, reevaluate some of the other options that were looked at. Um, those included removing the dam, establishing a, a new stream channel, those included using a four bay, which is not viable because of the, the rate of sediment gain within that system. Uh, the, the main option that seemed to have some viability we wanted to look at was the smaller offline lake option, which is essentially creating a, a acting creek as a stream, lowering the dam height, and creating a smaller lake to the side. But when we looked at that, it has significant costs. You have to over dredge, um, and creating 82,500 truck trips just to get it down to the base material below the existing sediment. Then you have to build a dam, a state-regulated dam that runs for half a mile along the creek, and it's a significant cost, about $200 million. The other issue is that we feel as staff that there, there are safety risks that are not acceptable. You're building a dam along a riverfront, which is subject to frequent flooding, and we do not we think there's significant risk associated with potential future dam failure, uh, and we don't think that's sustainable over time. So the implications we realize are significant uh, in the sense that community impacts, we know there is a loss of open water resource, which is the primary factor that's been driving this project is the desire to retain an open water system for aesthetic and recreational purposes. And we realize that that is a loss that would be realized if we do not dredge. At the same time, we could continue to manage Lake Akatank Park for the resources, for the public, 
for recreation that has tremendous potential and it has continued usage that would be, could be enhanced with additional effort. We would avoid all the trucking, the environmental impacts, and the costs associated with a, with a long-term dredging program, which I'll remind you is not currently funded. Uh, the environmental impacts, we know that most of the sediment that's captured by the lake will actually be caught in, that lake, in the Akatink Creek floodplain. This is based on empirical data from the U.S. Geological Survey from multiple studies, and it's been including a study that was included Akatink Creek that was conducted as part of a baywide survey that was published last year. Uh, the restoration within the creek channels is already required, so we have to re restore channels of Akatink Creek um, as part of Akatink Creek TMDL because the, the impairment is the sediment in the channels themselves. It's not what arrives down at the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the avoidance of loss of forest cover would be an environmental positive impact as part of not doing it. And the opportunity to manage the lake footprint uh, actually with intent so we can choose how to manage it for desired outcome. From a regulatory perspective, we have, to, we have to restore stream channels. We can't, even if we dredge the lake, we still have to pay for stream channel restoration within the system. Uh, we also feel there's a minimal amount of additional load that would be assigned to the county downstream of Lake Akatink as part of the Akatink Creek TMDL. We do not think it's that significant in, in, the, in the scale of things in terms of what we're already managing in that system. And in the project costs, we would avoid a, an average of $16 million per year for the next 25 years. That's just for 25 years. That cost continues to go up in out years as you continue to have to dredge once every five years. And then the stream restoration in the creek is, is necessary, again, to meet the county requirements, even if the lake was dredged. So these, the results of the survey that was conducted, we got 1,078 responses. Um, and if you have questions about the how this was done, Chris is the whiz on this because it's not my bailiwick, but it was done using standard uh, social science methods to analyze the data. Uh, and, and people were able to write in a free response. They were not required to say yes or no on a particular question. So that's how that was structured. Uh, and we do have published the results of that survey online. So you can see every comment, but there is no uh, personal data included in that record. Uh, of those responses, the vast majority live close to the lake, within five miles. Um, the interesting thing is that they were, of course, they were familiar with the study. 51% uh, visit pretty regularly. And then walking and hiking, biking is clearly the most frequent activity, with uh, boating also reported. The near equal number of people that responded in terms of dredging shows that there is a pretty even split in that response between yes dredge and do, no do not dredge. Um, in addition, we have folks concerned about dredging costs, and this is in terms of kind of how the response is kind of queued up in terms of the percent answered. Uh, also needing more information, uh, su support returning to looking at the park master plan and, and park visioning, and also supported su to some of them, 14%, transitioning to a wetland. So Chris, you want to take over here? In public, Chris Arrington, Director of Public Works and Environmental Services. So part of our ethos in public works is always get it done. And so it brings me no joy to come to the board with the recommendation that we come here today um, to not proceed with dredging as the board had originally directed staff. After reading all 1,078 of those comments, after participating in the public meetings that we had in February, I have a, a deep understanding or I have a, an appreciation of the deep connection um, that some residents have with the lake and their desire to save it at any cost. So it brings me no joy to disappoint them either. But as Mr. Smith and our um, expert consulting team in Arcadis have worked very hard to examine all options, and I very much appreciate the work that they have done. Uh, after that analysis, I don't see how it is in the county's best interest to proceed with dredging this reservoir. Dredging will be very expensive. The cost will be distributed across all county residents, and we can only proceed with the dredging initially if we're also willing to commit to ongoing maintenance dredging to make that investment count. One in five survey respondents, as Mr. Smith indicated, expressed opinions about the project cost. And of those uh, expressing an opinion, at a 20 to 1 ratio, um, respondents felt that the costs were too high uh, for the benefits. In looking just at the environmental impacts, I also conclude that the negative environmental impacts from dredging outweigh the positive environmental benefits that would be realized from maintaining Akatink as a lake. Again, nearly one in five survey respondents expressed concerns about um, environmental impacts associated with this decision, so clearly it is an important factor. 
Environmentally, there is no increase in flood risk if we don't dredge. Dredging would have a substantial negative carbon impact. Ongoing construction would be a recurring negative impact to the park and the neighborhoods. Not dredging will not harm the bay. And we will meet our regulatory obligations to protect the creek and the bay through stream restoration anyway, regardless of whether dredging proceeds and stream restoration is a more cost-effective and sustainable approach. At this cost, and because I believe the environmental negatives outweigh the environmental benefits, I don't find that proceeding with dredging is an efficient and effective um, use of our resources. However, I cannot easily quantify what the lake means to those residents who very dearly love it. Uh, although 89% of respondents use the park for walking and that isn't changing, uh, I can't do the cost-benefit analysis of what it means to lose the aesthetic value of the lake um, or what it would lose what, what, uh, the loss of the open water for those about 26% of respondents who have uh, recreated on the water from our survey, what that means to them. You may also be wondering why we're not presenting what happens if we don't dredge in more detail. And we are intentional in not presenting what will happen in the future if we do, don't, do not dredge. Our task was to determine how to dredge the lake, but our detailed analysis now suggests that is no longer feasible from my perspective. The lake will eventually transition to a wetland if we don't dredge. Wetlands are invaluable carbon stores, excellent water quality filters, and support high biodiversity. Survey respondents supported by a uh, more than twofold margin a transition to wetlands relative to being concerned about any negative consequences that could come from wetlands. However, when and how it transitions and what the ultimate state would be uh, is dependent upon the degree of maintenance and intervention that we apply. There are multiple options available and each of those options do come uh, with their own costs. So this is not a uh, multi-million or hundreds of millions of dollar cost to no cost decision. But because the, the, the change would be dependent, or because this is a change, excuse me, in community expectation, and because evolution of the lake moving forward is at least partially dependent upon the desires of the park users, that is why I am recommending that we do support the park authority in restarting the visioning process for the park. And with that, Director Cole, I turn to you. Hi, Jay Cole, Executive Director of the Park Authority. Um, as Chris said, this whole process began with a master plan for uh, Lake Akatink, and so part of our recommendation is to go back to the master plan, um, but with an investment in the results of the master plan for the community. So at the end of the day, um, we get they get something back from this um, this experience. So instead of a an open ended, you know, um, when it can get done, we have some sort of a commitment in working with the BOS to get something um, built. I I totally agree with. Um, um, Director Harrington, um, when there's various um, ways of building a wetland, and depending on what the results are, depends on how much money we put into to, to that. Um, so we support going back to the master plan and determining what's best for um, this community because it started because this was such a high-valued asset, a, such a high-valued park um, that we know we an, an aging park that we know we needed to, um, some new amenities. Okay, well, th well, thank you all very much. I think we all recognize the, the degree of difficulty here, given that we've had a conversation for this for now during the whole time that I've been on the board, which is seven years. So if it were simple, obviously the, the, the next steps would be easier and clearer to all of us. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it up to the chairman and give him an opportunity, and then board members could identify if you wanna speak. Uh, th thank you, Supervisor Stork. First, um, I want to start by, you know, thanking staff for the work that they've done. I know it's been significant and the public outreach was meaningful. Um, I, I do trust uh, Director Harrington when he says it brings him no joy uh, to bring this recommendation forward. Um, I can say as one supervisor who's represented this area for a long time and used this park since I was a mere child, um, it brings me absolutely no joy to hear that either. <laughs> Um, and so I think, you know, there's profound uh, disappointment in the conclusion that staff has made here. I don't think it's because there wasn't a thorough evaluation. I don't think it's because you started with the intention to do this, because I remember in the early stages of this, um, for those of us who involved in it, were involved in it very early, that we needed to have a new master plan for the park. Um, it was time to upgrade the facility, look at amenities. Um, I don't think at the beginning of that process anyone thought 
Uh, and there are people in this room, myself included, who have lived through dredges of this facility. And I don't think any of us thought that this was coming at us. In fact, I know none of us thought that this was coming at us. And so I, I guess, you know, I'm certainly not ready to, to pull the plug on this, um, to follow the staff recommendation, because I know I have a lot more questions. I think the, the, the public and community does, and I'm going to let uh, Supervisor Walkinshaw talk a little bit about what we think could be next steps, and we've, we've talked about this a little bit. But before I do that, um, you know, obviously, if the county were to go down this path, you've made the recommendation based on the task you were asked to do. Um, but I think, obviously, for all of our sake, there's going to be a new task asked at a minimum, which is to show us exactly uh, what would happen out here. Uh, show us exactly what the options for quote unquote management, wetland management would be um, at this facility. And, you know, I think the community is owed an exact explanation of what could happen here over what period of time and what do they think about that before we could close the door on anything. I mean, that's a completely reasonable expectation for uh, people in the community to have. And to me, that's a critical part of the next steps. I agree that there needs to be, you know, a, a resumption of the visioning process for the park and the master planning for the for the park. Um, I know that there's been uh, rumors out there about the demise of this park and what might happen to it in the future. And I just want to be perfectly clear about this. This property is owned by the Fairfax County Park Authority. And the Fairfax County Park Authority will manage this property no matter what as a public park open to the public as an amenity for people in the community. There's no other desire to do anything else uh, with this facility. Um, I do think as a part of our looking at what things could happen here if we don't dredge, because we know what the repercussions of dredging are, um, I do think we also need to give a look at the you know, wildlife, uh, ecological, cultural resources, other things that might be impacted by any decision to not dredge. So it's unclear to me, you know, what it would look like, uh, but it's also unclear to me what are the real environmental, uh, wildlife, waterfowl, other implications of doing this. And, and, you know, I know having lived through the Huntley Meadows Dam project um, that in that particular case it changed Huntley Meadows Park very much for the positive, but we got to a point where because we weren't managing it well enough, uh, we lost a lot of habitat. We're starting to see that come back. Um, and so I think we really need to get a really clear understanding of, of how that's impacted. And then if, in addition to that, uh, if we were not to dredge this facility, what does that mean for other amenities that could be at the park um, or what else uh, would the community want to see happen here uh, if we went down that path? And that's where I think the revisioning part is important. But I don't think you can get to revisioning, uh, new visioning, or a park master plan process until we get a really clear picture of what could happen here if we don't dredge this facility. Um, and, and I know that wasn't within the original task, but I think it's an obligatory task um, at this point before we could make a final decision about dredging or not. The last, te just a technical question I wanted to ask, because I think the, the most disturbing thing about this to me is the five-year maintenance dredging program. Um, I think the initial cost of dredging doesn't give me pause. Um, you know, obviously, I don't <laughs> look, you know, short-sightedly at spending $95 million, but if I knew I was spending $95 million to save this lake in perpetuity or for an extended period of time, it would be worth the investment. But the idea of the amount of intrusion that would happen here every five years, having lived through past dredges, I guess my technical question is, is the five-year maintenance dredging program that is outlined here the only option? Um, and how do we come up with five-year intervals? So the the load that's arriving at the lake uh, is pretty consistently an estimated <coughs> somewhere around 46,000 cubic yards per year. That's based on average over time. And that's, ba that's heavily weather dependent. So for instance, Tropical Storm Lee uh, uh, deposited a disproportionate amount of sediment. 
But the, the bottom line is as that lake gets emptied, it's much more efficient at taking out a fraction of that load. So we estimated in 2016 that it was removing about 50% of that load, about 20, 23,000 cubic yards per year. But as it gets deeper and it has more space, it'll capture a much higher percentage. So what we felt was that in order to properly plan a, a maintenance program for its life cycle costs and needs, five years was an appropriate time frame to estimate we'd have to, we'd capture at least 150,000 cubic yards and need to come empty it back out. And that's just because of the nature of this, this system. It's a 30 square mile drainage area with high imperviousness and high stream erosion. Now we are working hard to cut that down over time, but it'll take many decades before the work we can do could reduce that load enough to reduce the capture rate. Because even as the load arriving at the lake comes down, its ability to capture a certain amount doesn't go down as you empty it. So even if you dropped it to 30,000 cubic yards per year, as the lake got emptied, it would capture the majority of that 30,000 cubic yards. So it's just about the capture efficiency of the lake as you, as you empty it. And that's really what's driving that return frequency for the maintenance dredging. So in other words, if you were recommending a 10-year uh, gap, you would, you would still be moving twice the amount. And would the cost be the same? I mean, I'm trying to think of, you know, the cost implications, the environmental implications, the neighborhood implications. If you stretch these intervals out, what would that mean? Would it, would it mean the cost goes up? Yeah. Would it mean there's further damage to habitat as a result of that that we have to factor? I mean, what would it mean if you replace the five-year dredge schedule with every 10 years? Well, the, the effects of the 2008 dredge were erased in a very short period of time. Um, the, the key is that if you waited 10 years, it's possible to reach that. If you still keep eight feet as your target, you could capture 500,000 cubic yards in 10 years. You could be back to where you, in other words, you, well, 350,000 have to over dredge to get back to your rate, just like we are now. In other words, now we say we would take 400,000 cubic yards out in order to get eight feet, but you're still capturing it as you dredge, which takes three years. So what you would do is you would take what you would do in a one year period every five years, do it twice, you might have to go back to another three-year dredge and have much increased quantity. And so you really, to keep up and, and make it functional for the purposes that we were given as the targets, you really need to return more frequently. You don't save any money. I think you actually end up being more costly. The other thing we discussed was if you do not dredge frequently, every time you dredge, you have to learn how to do it again so you're less efficient. And you also, the community has forgotten about what it takes to dredge. And now that, that displacement of community resources and the loss opportunity by the public is enhanced. So yes, you spread out the interval, but now the pain is revisited and the duration of that dredge is prolonged. So we don't think there's any savings and actually it could be the, the opposite. It could be more costly over time to increase the time intervals between the dredge cycles. Okay. Well, I, <clears throat> you know, I'll withhold any, any other comments until uh, after we talk about next steps, because I know we, we want to spend a moment talking about that. But again, I, you know, I, I have a hard time uh, stomaching the recommendation. I, I have a lot of other questions, but that's not to say I don't appreciate uh, the work that you all have done to get us to this point. Um, it's not the news I don't think any of us uh, wanted to hear, but um, I, I don't doubt the integrity of what you've done here, but I think you all have to also understand that as a result of the process we've been through, uh, there's still a lot of questions out there we need to answer, I think, before we can make a decision here on what to do next. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, Supervisor Walkinshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and first, thank you for giving us some time on, on your busy agenda for this. And I also want to thank uh, the thousand plus community members who responded to the survey and submitted their comments and the hundreds and thousands over the years who have advocated uh, on behalf of, of Lake Akatink. And uh, the term that some of my constituents have used to describe Lake Akatink is a treasure. And I think that's apt. It is a treasure uh, for Fairfax County. It's an amenity that's beloved by generations and people have the stories of taking their grandchildren and their children there are going there with their grandparents and their grand and their uh, uh, children and and my family's in that category I have vivid memories of, of taking my son there mm -hmm. shortly after he was born and and uh, would like to take my grandkids there someday 
Um, we made a commitment, Fairfax County made a commitment uh, to save Lake Akatink and by dredging it, we made that commitment in 2019. Uh, we said it would cost close to $30 million and there would be relatively minimal maintenance dredging costs and a lot of folks are angry and, and hurt uh, that we're talking about not keeping that commitment. I just want to acknowledge that that's, that's a very real feeling that people across the county have. The survey results um, were mixed. I think that's a fair description. Uh, but this lake has hundreds, thousands of very strong and passionate supporters, especially in the neighborhoods around it, but, but all around the county. Um, for my colleagues, I know that the new, the new cost estimates are eye-popping. Uh, it's a lot of money. But I, I agree with the chairman. I'm not ready to give up on the possibility of dredging or to accept the staff recommendation. I think if the board is not willing to commit the resources to do the full dredge, uh, we owe people a lot more answers as to what would happen and what it would look like. And the truth is we have not conducted any kind of a comprehensive study or analysis of the managed wetland option. And I don't think it would be responsible for us to make a decision without doing that. Also, I think we need to acknowledge that the way this process um, has proceeded, uh, where over the last seven to eight years, uh, staff and consultants have worked diligently, um, but on their own to conduct studies and then produce recommendations that are then shared with the community for feedback hasn't created the level of trust that that we need. Um, and that's why I'm going to suggest and Chairman McKay, Supervisor Lusk, and I at an upcoming board meeting uh, will propose to establish a task force on the future of Lake Akatink uh, to review the recommendation and, and the work and studies that have taken place up to this point to more um, uh, fully study and analyze the managed wetland option so the community knows and the board knows if that's the direction we go, what it actually means. Um, and to consider the possibility of a hybrid approach that maintains an open water uh, feature. And we'll suggest that that task force deliver findings to the Board of Supervisors to inform our decision. So to my colleagues who maybe have been prepared to say, we've got to give up on this and accept the staff recommendation because it's too much money, I would just ask you to wait. Uh, let the task force do its work and report its findings back to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor. And I'm going to call on Supervisor Lust, given your, your involvement with this as well. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I'll just uh, thank uh, Supervisor Walkinshaw and the Chairman for their previous comments and align myself with those. Um, this is a tough issue, and I know in my own community, um, there are, are environmental impacts that will affect our community directly if there are decisions made about how the uh, dredge materials are removed. But we also know that this is an asset that the community very much enjoys and wishes to see continue be in existence. So I appreciate this thought in terms of putting together a task force for us to look at the um, options and to bring those back for the board to consider. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to ask a couple questions um, in, in connection, though, and I, and I just appreciate the, the summary of the public survey comments, so thank you for, for doing this. And the, the thing that was really striking to me, which is something I've definitely done at the park, is the hiking, the walking, and the running. And you've listed here that 89% of the residents noted that as their principal use at the, at the park. So that's significant, very, very significant. So one of the things I'd be interested in knowing is when we look at this conversion to the wetlands, will there be any impacts that would affect the use of the trail network in that conversion? So will people still be able to hike, walk, run, do all the things that we're currently doing today um, once this, once this um, migration to the wetlands occurs. 
Um, the second question I have is, I think, um, Mr. Smith, when you talked about the stream stabilization or rest restoration, you mentioned that that's something that would need to be done um, um, at the park. Do, do we have any details specifically on what that stabilization, what that restoration would entail? And then do we also have any cost associated with actually undertaking that? Um, you want to answer the first question? Uh, Jay Cole, Executive Director of the Park Authority. Um, as part of any master plan, um, the answer is ultimately yes, but I don't want to pre preclude, I suppose there's an option where a million people come out and say they don't want to enter into the park anymore, yeah. but I seriously doubt that that would right. um, exist. So um, pe we, people really value the trail system and the ability to um, to walk around um, and hike and bike and run. Yeah. And I would imagine that we would I know we would highlight whatever amenity is there in their ability to circumnavigate whatever it is that um, that still exists there. We just finished, um, we're about to finish a, a very large project um, with the trail system. And the reason why this impact, mm -hmm. this did not impact that um, bridge was because we always will have a very, very um, heavily utilized and valued trail system in Lake Akatink, um, regardless of what happens here. We would just hope to augment and, and um, enhance that experience. Okay. I, I, I appreciate that. And I would imagine that in this discussion of options, you'll be able to detail some of the different use, uses that might exist as a result of those individual options. Um, and then let me ask, I, I know that we have some requirements that are connected to the Akatink Creek uh, TMDL, and just trying to understand if we don't dredge, how do we address the specifics around those TMDL requirements, and do we have any sense of what those costs might be? Yes, sir. Um, so we we don't we have done some rough estimates in terms of if you took looked at how much sediment's being produced by the creek, and if you reduce it by X amount over time. I don't have a hard number for you today, but I'll say we've right. done a lot of analysis. Our previous uh, efforts to address local TMDLs. So the difference that we're facing right. here is that in the past we were driven largely by the Chesapeake Bay TMDL, which said that the county had to reduce a certain amount of sediment, uh, nitrogen, and phosphorus from arriving at the Chesapeake Bay. We have met that goal. The county's been very aggressive okay. at, at addressing the Chesapeake Bay TMDL goal. Mm -hmm. So now we're switching largely, or more and more, we're switching to local TMDLs. Those are much harder because there is a much higher amount of sediment load that we have to take out. Akatink, I can say with great certainty, we have invested a tremendous amount in Akatink, okay. um, all the way from Nottoway Park up by Vienna, a tremendous amount in Providence District, Mason District, Braddock District, Springfield District, and in Franconia. We're, we're implementing and have implemented stream projects. Um, to date, I don't have exact number for you, but I believe we probably invested somewhere in the neighborhood of about $25 million so far. Wow. Um, we have a project in Braddock District called Long Branch Central. It's to address the Long Branch Central TMDL, which is a subset of the Acton Creek TMDL, mm -hmm. with a current price tag of about $40 million that we are have the public has reviewed and we're working to implement. Uh, and we will continue to move forward. So I don't have a final number for you, sir, but we, I can say we're working very aggressively with the Acton Creek Watershed to try to approach that issue. We don't have any a window over time in which that load would be reduced significantly enough to dramatically reduce the load at the lake. That's something we don't know. And that's largely because of the nature of the shed uh, and how big it is and, then, and the storm-driven aspect of a lot of the, the production of the sediment. Okay, no, I appreciate that. And then um, I'll make one last point and or request. When you look at the options for the dredge, if it would be possible to show actual facilities in other places that we could reference what that might look like for the future of Lake Agatink. So basically showing us what the future could look like by giving us examples of other places where those exist. I think that would just be helpful for people to see and maybe if they can go out and visit, get a sense of how those are operated and, and managed. And then uh, last, I wanna thank um, Mr. Smith uh, specifically, and I wanna thank Mr. Harrington as well for their exceptional work in uh, communicating to the community what the county's decision and position has been 
I want to acknowledge that I myself was in some meetings where I know there were some tough questions, and I want to say Mr. Smith handled those, and Mr. Harrington as well, extraordinarily well. And I know how committed you are to helping us make the right decision here. So I just wanted to publicly say that, and uh, thank you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, for Supervisor Lawson. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Gross. Thank you, and thank you, Charles. We've been working together a long time. It's been nice to see you move, moving up um, in our county uh, uh, leadership. A um, couple of questions and then some comments. First of all, total acreage of the park and the acreage of the lake. Can you remind me that? Because the overview looks like the park is considerably large, and the um, lake is a portion of it. The lake is about 55 acres. I believe the park acres is 493. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, although Lake Akatink is not in Mason District, its sediment is, because the set of the last time there, I believe it was just the last time it was dredged. Maybe the two times it was dredged, it was pumped to Mason District. Um, but we're full. We don't have any space for additional dredge soils. Um, this is a bitter pill to swallow, absolutely. Um, but I think it's better to know these amended costs now than if we had started doing something in 2019, actual construction, and then found out that we were going down a rabbit hole. Um, so the, the, the um, sort of putting a, a stop to or a pause uh, during the pandemic was not a bad thing. Um, a couple of questions about, now, um, Supervisor, I think Supervisor Walkinshaw mentioned a task force. I presume that this task force will not be the same one that would be doing the visioning of the master plan. These would be two separate groups. Is that correct? I, I would assume that that's going to be the situation. Yeah, that would certainly be my intention. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, to, to that point, Penny, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think you can remaster plan until right. the task force finishes the conversation. Well, and that's okay. I just want to make sure that we're not laying um, the same tasks on um, the, the same two, two, two completely separate tasks on the same group of people that we actually would have two groups of people and maybe some would be membership would be different, but it would, be it, would it would have to run. What is it? We call it seriatim. Okay. Um, but once we got into the master plan for, for the park authority, how long does that master planning process take? I know that some in my district have taken forever and then sat on the shelf. So how long would you anticipate once a visioning process started? Could you do it in a year? Could you do it in less? Um, absolutely, we can do it in a year. Um, we, we have, and this is not to rush any decision, but we knew that this was, you know, coming up the minute mm -hmm. that um, the Board of Supervisors makes any decision, we would start on our master planning process if that was the decision okay. the next day. We know that it's coming. We have the staff ready um, to do it. I think the important aspect of, of this particular one is for it not to sit on the shelf. We are undergoing a, a relook at our master plans to make sure that that happens. One of my large pet peeves okay. Um, okay. as well. We want to promise the same community that we do the master plan when we build something and not promise the community something yes. and then build yes. it 30 years later. So I think that it's important that the intent and the and the movement and the final result be part of this decision so that we're doing a master plan for something that is going to go from planning okay. to design to okay. building. All right, because it took more than 10 years to go from visioning to actual construction for Hogue Park, and I don't see that we have that kind of time. Um, if we did nothing... If, if nothing was done, if we just sort of laid it, made it the status quo, what is the anticipated lifespan of the lake? As, as Director Harrington indicated, we can't predict that. It's really, it's very difficult. It's possible to look just like it does now for many years. For many years, okay. And we do know that it, it slowed down dramatically in its capture rate from 2016 to 2021. It only captured 50,000 cubic yards in about five years. So that's a, that's a great slowdown. And again, it's also very much event driven. Large storms change everything. They could remove a lot of sediment from the lake and they could deposit a lot of sediment from the lake. So I think it's, it's very difficult to predict. One thing I will say, we have 
thought about it a bit internally, and I think that you, what you can do with a, a managed wetland is you can be more intentional. You can engineer it and look at ways to yeah. direct that sediment so that you can have a desired outcome or predictable outcome. Um, so that's if that's helpful, but I, we can't okay. predict how it will look if left. Yeah, we know that Hurricane Agnes in 1972 took out Lake Barcroft. There was no lake; it disappeared, um, and um, and so a lot of work went back into. But that's a private lake. That's not a that's not a, a, a county a facility. Um, one last request, I guess I would suggest, and I've seen this done in other environmental situations, and it might be sort of helpful. Uh, as one of the aspects, is if you take something like LIDAR and um, do a sort of over time to demonstrate how the, how the park and the lake area would look with these changes. Sometimes it's helpful to see that in because so often we look at the aerial view. The aerial view doesn't give us, you know, the up close and personal view. And I think there's LIDAR and probably newer technologies now that would be able to give you, give us that kind of, of 3D look. So that would be um, a suggestion that you might want to consider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Gross. I have Supervisor Alcorn, then Supervisor Hillard. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, quick technical question. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I need to ask. Stream restoration and stream channel restoration, are those the same things? Yes, sir. So basically, okay. there is the potential to do stabilization, which in the old days, you basically armored it. Was that was you created rip -rap. better way, yeah, riprap and better ways yeah. to move that stormwater away. What we try to do now is in the restoration is more mimic natural processes better so that it conveys the water and also allows vegetation to regrow and hopefully over time returns biology to the stream itself. Yeah, that's, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure, because I heard the two different terms she used, and I just want to make sure there wasn't anything I didn't understand there. I, I was on the Park Authority Board when this came up, at least the most recent iteration of dredging came up. I believe it was 2017. And, um, and I remember there was a lot of discussion back then uh, about it. There was, at the time, we were talking about TMDLs for Chess Bay, and uh, so that was obviously different. Um, I definitely remember... It seemed like a lot of money then, but it was a lot less money than what we're talking about today. Um, the other thing that I remember was um, it was a close call environmentally then um, because of the disruption associated with dredging. Um, obviously, for continued use of the lake as it is, that was pretty clear, the outcome. But the impacts of, of dredging and and the disposal of the dredge material and, you know, the transportation and all, all that. Um, I remember there was an open discussion about that. And But the other thing that I, I you know, and this is kind of where we got as a Park Authority board back then, was because of the dollar amounts involved, we, we basically bumped it upstairs to the Board of Supervisors. It's like, you know, this is, uh, I mean, that was the, the thinking. You know, we don't set the tax rate on the Park Authority Board, and this is something really that the county board overall um, needed to deal with. So I, I of course, now I'm on this board. Uh, <laughs> can't escape it anymore, but nowhere else to punt this one to, I guess. Um, but I, I am, you know, I, I'm, I'm okay waiting, um, you know, and, and seeing, you know, what a task force can come up with, but, but I, I have to say, um, I'm very sympathetic to the staff recommendation, um, and if I had to vote today, I would I would vote with staff. Um, this is an awful lot of money, and uh, particularly for a countywide tax uh, that supports it, and the proportion that this would require. And and you know the chairman said it. it the one that really gets me is the annual cost, the recurring annual costs. Uh, it's just be really tough. So. Um, Again, I, I look forward to seeing how this plays out, but I, I didn't want anybody to think um, anything different. So I appreciate what staff is doing and continuing to work with the community on this. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Alcorn, Supervisor Herity, then Supervisor Smith. So I, I believe after redistricting, I, I don't have any piece of Lake Akatink anymore. You mentioned Springfield District abuts it, but I don't think that doesn't mean that it's not near and dear to my heart. It is, and a lot of my residents. Uh, it certainly is. I, uh, 
I actually grew up, my first childhood home was on Hanover, Hanover Avenue, right down the street from the lake, and we spent a lot of time there. I still have a lot of good memories. Uh, the 80 percent's no surprise to me. Burke Lake Park is our most visited park, and the, the biggest reason people come there is the loop trail around the lake. People like to walk trails around water. I mean, that's just the way it is, and uh, I think that's why you, you're finding this is even uh, even harder. Just a couple of, of questions and thoughts, and I'm just I made notes as I was going through the slides. Um, it says the park was visited by over 250,000 people per year. I went back and looked at 2019. It said 300,000 people per year. We had a. I mean, I, I would think during post pandemic it'd be higher, not lower. Um, <clears throat> our pandemic levels for trails were absolutely astronomical okay. and out of the roof. That does not surprise me at all. There's a reason why the CDC, when they closed everything down and said to stay home, they came back two days later and said, except for trails, yeah. keep, keep trails open. So that does not surprise me. No, but it's the, it, it said it was 300,000 in 2019 and it says 250,000 now. That's a drop. That doesn't seem right to me. I'll just suggest that um, I, I will acknowledge that our number, but I, I didn't recheck that number with the Park Authority. Okay. I did um, acknowledge okay. that there's a note in one of the, uh, the website sections that that number is much higher than 250,000. So it's, it's, that was a number that was uh, counted at one point, but I know that I acknowledge I'll defer to the Park Authority in terms of trying to estimate what that number is. I'll also add that um, Lake Akatink, like a um, little different than Burke Lake, has so many entrances. And so the number of counting by cars and people coming in the front is going to vastly underestimate the amount of people coming in from the neighborhoods and the other trails. I know all about that from both parks because they come through our neighborhoods and they park in our neighborhoods and some of our neighbors don't like it. Um, so we do hear that quite a bit. Um, like I said, I was comparing this to what we did back in 2019. Our project goals in 2019 included stormwater management, and they seem to have been dropped from this slide. Is there a reason we dropped stormwater management? As sir, yes, yes, sir. So staff looked at that on the stormwater side, and our specific recommendation to our director at that time was this is not a stormwater facility. It can't be managed in a sustainable way to meet appreciable stormwater goals. It doesn't have a detention capability. It's a pass-through lake. So every time it rains, it doesn't really hold back any water. So it doesn't reduce the actual flow. It also doesn't remove enough sediment to be effective to clean water quality in a meaningful way, as is generally calculated through stormwater facility management. So we recommended that this not be a stormwater facility internally. Uh, and I know that the goals that we were working with and we, we outlined just at the start of the project was the eight foot depth and the uh, establishing the maintenance program for recreational aesthetic purposes. Okay, and the eight foot depth comes from where? That came from the original study w, done by WSSI. When we were looking at a, a water body that could be sustainable for fishing, for boating, to have some clarity to it because the shallower it is, the more turbid it is, mm -hmm. it stays muddy. Yep. So by creating some depth, it's able to clear up between storm events. So the thought was if we hit eight feet, that would be enough to give us a buffer between dredge cycles as well as to provide between those dredge cycles some, that, a, a better water quality uh, and aesthetic environment. Was, that the, was it, that the same depth in 2019 or did that change? No, it was eight foot all eight each time. Was, yes, that's, so that's been consistent throughout. Yes, sir. Um, I'm on slide four. Just to, just looking at options and and things, and hopefully the task force will take a look at some of these. The, the Conowingo, Conowingo Dam obviously has got the same issue that we do. I know they were able to, but they're hydroelectric, so it's a it's it's a different. But I know they were able to get uh, EPA grants there. Um, have we approached our congressional delegation about? federal grants, EPA grants, any of that kind of thing to help offset some of the cost? We have looked into the concept of grants. What we've discovered is that there are not grants for maintenance of stormwater facilities. Um, there, are, there are grants for, for essentially dam removal and to do things that provide a long-term sustainable environmental benefit, but to maintain a stormwater facility, that's on the locality. So we, we have, do not, are not aware of any, any funding source to do maintenance. 
uh, not even on park. But I mean, that, again, it's Conowingo Dam did it. That was a dredging facility, but again, it's a hydroelectric, so maybe it's maybe it's different. But that wasn't a stormwater project either, and it wasn't a dam removal or. There, I believe. Chris won't come. I don't know the specifics, but it may be more related to the fact that it could be a water supply, whereas Lake Acting is not a water supply. So that is, um, there are a lot of federal funds available now for uh, resiliency around water supply. Okay. I, I don't know for a fact. Okay. Well, we, we probably should spend some time with our congressional folks just to see what, what they might have. Uh, obviously, the first thing that came to my mind when you look at some of this, the, some of the pictures on chart four is, is Virginia Beach seems to be the pro because although they don't have to dry it and haul it away, they just pump it from offshore back onto the beaches. But have we reached out to them at all to see what kinds of things they do? Well, we didn't look at Virginia Beach. Um, the, like beach replenishment is interesting because that's taking one material, moving a material from one place to another, mm -hmm. obviously to create mm -hmm. a recreational resource in that case mm -hmm. uh, and, a, and an economic uh, resource. Um, we looked at several beneficial reuse options. The primary two, one is uh, discussing with Luck Ecosystems, which was one of the largest materials processing companies in the state of Virginia. And they have a very advanced soils processing capability and, and separation capability. Yep. They, they told us flat our quantities are too large. They, can't, they couldn't keep up with the dredge material. You have to have a, such a large site and, and do, separate out what you would term a meaningful fraction that portion of the material that could be repurposed into a soil product or something else. A second one was recommended by a resident, and it was with a company that, that makes building materials out of dredge spoils. Um, they are headquartered in Jacksonville, Florida. When we interviewed them, they looked at our sediment report. They said it's possible you could convert it to a building material, but they do not have any. They, they're trying to work in Baltimore, and they're trying to work in Norfolk, and they can't establish programs in either Baltimore or Norfolk yet. So those sites are still taking their dredge spoils and dumping them in the bay and in the sense of Baltimore create islands for wetlands. And Norfolk's looking for options because they used to do the same thing, create islands out of their, out of their dredge spoils, but they're having to seek alternatives because they're running out of space. Uh, so the bottom line is, is for that beneficial reuse, you'd have to barge it to Florida. And we were clear that that's, there's no savings there. So we did look at that option. Um, there's not a simple way to waste it or to repurpose it that we found that would save cost. Um, did we ever look at look, using the railroad spur? I was going to say that's because that's, yes, again, tra transportation is a big piece of this. Yes, sir. So in that instance, looking again at the fact that we couldn't find a place to reuse it, the the, the railroads generally are hauling a usable product, sand, gravel, coal, mm -hmm. something that is going from a source to an end user. Um, in order to haul it, you have to specialize cars. So when we looked, we, we discussed, we had actually at the time as our consultant reached out to industry, and they were looking at the availability of cars, the size of sidings, and then you have to figure out where to take it because very few places will take uh, essentially sludge. Yep. and be able to dump it at a siding where it has to then be picked up and moved somewhere else to be deposited. So we couldn't find any place to take the spoils. So we felt that rail was not a viable option because of the difficulty of the loading process, the hauling process, and disposal. We couldn't see any economic benefit in terms of our viability uh, with that option. So that's not a good one. Correct, sir. I got it. Um, let's see what else I got here. Pass on that one. Um, on the public survey, did we get any indication of how many people were concerned about, I mean, how many of the people that opposed the dredging were concerned about trucking through the neighborhoods? Because I see a bunch of other stuff. Did we ask about trucking? So the survey was an open response question. It so was just straight how do you open. feel about it? Yep. And so then we coded using standard social science practices to look for what people were responding. Um, we noticed that about 4% of the 1,078 respondents ended it, indicated a concern about the hauling aspects. Okay. All right. I would have thought it might have been, from what I'm hearing, I would have thought it would have been higher than 4%, but if it was open-ended and they didn't list it, they didn't list it. Um, you know, we, we talk a lot about uh, the cost of doing nothing. Um, I, I don't, I think one of the things that I'm sure the task force is going to look at this 
is really the impact downstream if we don't dredge the lake. And that's, that's one of the key things that I've heard from people that have contacted my office is the cost of doing nothing. And I, I think we do need to look at that. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to ask now, but I think that's something that clearly needs to be looked at. Uh, timeline on decision. That's up to the board. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm still looking for input from us today. Number one, do we, do we have enough information? Number two, is it dredge, no dredge, which was the original question. And so far, I'm not hearing people saying we should dredge. I'm also hearing a lot of other questions, which I think I know that the chairman and others have spoken about some further look at this that they're going to bring back to the board. So, Sue, I heard I don't want to interrupt. What nope, you nope. I think that was kind of kind of it. And okay. I know it's a, it's, it's a tough one. It's a real tough one. Thank you. Supervisor Smith, and then we'll have... Supervisor Faust, I'll check. Thank you. Um, you know, I appreciate all the questions because it's obvious the, the level of detail that you've taken to look into this and look into different options and different choices, and I think that's reassuring to hear that piece. Um, I do have a question about, you talked about disposing of the sediment at the quarry. Um, you know, it comes from the public. Are those materials safe? What do they do to groundwater? Can you just give me a high-level um, explanation of that? Well, since the quarry is in your district. I, that's why I'm asking the question. And you'll be happy to know the quarry is permitted by Fairfax County, not by DEQ and not okay. by the EPA. So okay. we held several meetings with Luck. Um, they have very specific criteria and levels. Right. The levels in our analysis that we did with our extensive sediment sampling show that we, with all but one sample, which was a benzene hit, which we feel is some of an anomaly, all but one sample were well within their criteria to be deposited in the quarry as suitable fill. Um, so based on that, you, you also have to do extensive testing during the dredging operation. So you have to test it while it's being dredged. And there's random sampling of different loads to make sure you're within the criteria. And they even reserve the right to sample as you drop it on the pad. Mm -hmm. So in each case, you have to meet their criteria in order to be able to be left at their site. In addition, you have to meet moisture parameters. If it's too wet, you have to pay more. So you have to dewater it more to keep your costs down while you're doing it, which takes a little bit longer. So there's a lot of parameters. But I think what we found was luck was not only their business model is very tight, mm -hmm. they have very specific criteria and they have predictable rates. They also have great capacity. They could take 14 million cubic yards in the north cell alone. So they could keep us in business with depositing dredge materials mm -hmm. for probably 25 years before, and then the south cell will be open by that time. Yeah. So we felt that luck was the most reliable uh, and lowest cost option and predictable. And yes, we met their criteria. Okay. I, I'm happy to hear that. But with all that being said, the, the cost is prohibitive, you know, and, and I understand, you know, the process and the expectations and, you know, when the community has a resource, they want to keep it. But I think the cost is prohibitive. I, th I think it is going to be beneficial to have a task force to look at this, to look at what options are, because people need to know what to ex expect. But um, I appreciate the work. Um, and I do think that the dredging is difficult because of the cost. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Smith. Supervisor Faust. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I I'm I'm glad the recommendation is to continue to look at this because I think it's it's absolutely a huge decision that we're being asked to make, and uh, you know it, we kind of turned pretty dramatically from where we were, you know, over the years, thinking how we could resolve this, and uh, so it, it's good, but uh, you know I, I definitely see uh, serious cost impacts, obviously. Uh, I think environmental impacts running 50,000 truck trips, did you say? Is that one way or two ways? So it's, it's, um, it's two ways because you have to bring the trucks in to pick up the load and bring the trucks out to drop the load. So it's Right. Yes, okay. Sir. So it's, it's 25,000 times. So no, sir. It's 50,000 in, 50,000 out. So we just counted a, a full round right. trip as one trip, but it's 50,000 in, 50,000 out. Yeah. Okay. Is that that? Yeah. That's a lot. Uh, the, um, 
the path of those trucks is, you know, interests me. I mean, uh, I know if I owned a home on a, a road where over three years, 100,000 trucks will pass back and forth, right? Is that what you're saying? I would like to know what that path is. It's probably, I know it's not in my district, and so I apologize for asking. <laughs> well, I but, you know, if there's, a, if there's 10,000 people impacted, that's different than if there's 20 people impacted. Yes, sir. We, we looked at that very extensively. Um, we had two sites we considered viable, the Wakefield Park site and the Southern Drive site. Wakefield Park's in Braddock District on Braddock Road, and the Southern Drive is in the Franconia District off of, off of Highland Street, which comes into the park, and it comes off of Backlick and, and uh, Cumberland. The, there was significant concern in the, in the Franconia community in Springfield because it would have to come through neighborhoods. There was no way around it. The only way into that site was to drive through neighborhoods. And because you had to come in and come out on the same roads, 100,000 trips. So uh, roughly um, 180 trips per day. And that community was very concerned about that potential truck traffic in that community. But it was a viable option from the perspective of it had the right area. It was in an industrial park. So that was one site that we considered technically feasible, but there was definitely concern there. Now on the Wakefield side, the original concept that was being kind of promoted was you would come in and come out by the Beltway. If you, Wakefield Park has one traffic light, it is a highly visited park, it has a rec center, courts, mountain biking, it has farmer's market, summer camps, you name it, it's going on. We would essentially shut the park down for three years. There's no way you could use that traffic light with 95 truck trips, and actually, again, you have to double because it has to turn in and turn back out, so it's 180 passes through the intersection. Uh, you would basically shut the park down for three years. So we felt, as staff, that's not viable. Instead, we thought that in order to make it viable, you would have to have a deceleration lane off of, come off the beltway, decelerate into a unique and isolated processing area. Trucks turn, they load, they go back out with an acceleration lane going west to go out to the Fairfax County Parkway up to 66 and out to Centerville to the quarry. Because you could not create, and you know with the widening of Braddock Road that's going on now, Braddock Road has tremendous traffic, and it's currently, it's going to be widened in the near future. There's no way to create a second intersection with a traffic light. So we felt that the only way to maintain a traffic flow and minimize impacts and keep the park open would be to come off the beltway again, turn in, turn out, and go west on Braddock. We realize that's also, again, a lot of trucks, but that was the only way we figured you could route them in a way to minimize impacts. Okay. Uh, 400 million over 20 years was the number you laid out, is that, is that correct? Yes, sir. So roughly 95 million for the base dredge and right. escalating costs, 300 million for four recurring maintenance cycles of dredge. I mean, uh, sometimes numbers are difficult to put in perspective, but basically, uh, if I rem remember correctly, and Jay will correct me, particularly if I'm under uh, or over, it's $100 million every six years for the park authorities bond currently? Um, for the 2026 bond, it's at 180. 180, okay. So uh, four years, $100 million years? for four years. So this 2020 bond was $100 million for four years. Okay. I'm just trying to put it in perspective. I mean, I know there'll be different funding sources, but this is almost equivalent to the entire park CIP budget over that 20-year period. Correct. Uh, and, and I do know that it wouldn't all necessarily, like, if any, would come out of the park farm. Um, okay. Well, I think that that's my questions for today, but, uh, you know, I'm anxious to see where this thing goes and you know, keep an open mind on it. Thank you, Supervisor Fowles. Supervisor Palachuk, and then we'll have a go back to Supervisor Walkinshaw. Well, I appreciate that, and I'll be brief. I think a lot has been shared, and, and clearly some of us are coming very late uh, in the game to this. So, um, number one, very much appreciate that there will be a task force uh, looking at this. I think this is a, a complex issue, um, and we've talked about some of the, um, thank you, uh, the impacts on, on the budget and the costs there, um, and probably because we studied wetlands my freshman year in high school. Um, <laughs> um, I'm here sitting and wondering, uh, I don't know the full history of this area, the creek. Um, first of all, do we know, did this used to be a dry wetland, just a creek 
Do we know what it was before? It's, uh, I think it's fairly typical. They picked a narrow point in the stream valley, they built a dam, and then it's just a drowned riverine valley. Okay, I appreciate that. So a little bit different managed wetland versus one of the natural or re, re, we don't call them reconstructed, um, but saved, I guess, wetlands <laughs> that we have out there. Um, yeah, I think for me, it, it, as long as we have that time, it seems like there's no um, need to make uh, a faster decision. I think understanding the cost impacts and opportunities, um, both on the community, uh, the natural uh, impacts, I think we do, for me, it's really important that final line here saying um, supporting the needs, wildlife habitat, um, and the the park authority and the county policies. Because I think when we say parks, uh, it's a big umbrella, right? Uh, when we say parks, it's anywhere from recreational facilities to our natural um, resources. And, and we know that uh, we've done some good things and we've done some things that have hurt those natural resources. So I think being able to understand those, uh, the impact on the community um, and both the um, costs and benefits to the natural resources and habitats, uh, as well as the community and creative ideas for other ways to help ensure that the, the recreational components um, and the, the benefits to the community um, can, be, can be looked at, I think, are important. So again, I appreciate that. I'm sorry, Supervisor Walkinshaw, that you've inherited this uh, very challenging um, need to um, look at the future of this um, I guess, Lake and, and Akatink, but um, I appreciate the, the work and your time and, and the chairman and supervisor Lusk. Um, I do think that it's not an easy one, but I, I do hope that we can find uh, a way to address as many of the, the needs as possible. Thank you, Supervisor Palchuk, Supervisor Walkshaw. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, just, just want to correct one thing, because Mr. Smith said we're widening Braddock Road. We're, we're not widening it. We do have an improvement project. You're trying to get me in more trouble. Yeah. Um, we do have an, a Braddock Road improvement project. And, you know, just, just to, the, to the truck issue, um, and Mr. Smith outlined the two possible routes, east or west, on Braddock Road, both create challenges. Uh, going west on Braddock Road does go through neighborhoods. Uh, because there are people whose homes are on Braddock Road, and obviously the neighborhoods that, that border it. Going east creates the conflict with the park uh, and with folks who are leaving Ravensworth Farm and other neighborhoods and crossing that already difficult intersection. So the, the trucks are an issue. That, you know, that said, I think um, from Braddock District perspective, from my perspective, the trucks are not a deal breaker. I know if we move forward, there will be... Uh, high school gymnasium at some point full of hundreds of people angry at me about the trucks. Uh, but I think, I think this project is worth, is worth doing. So the trucks are not, are not a deal breaker from, from my perspective. And I, I want to just thank my colleagues for keeping an open mind and giving the task force the time to, to work through this and make sure we're presented with a full picture before a decision is made. And I want to highlight a couple of things for the my colleagues, if you haven't already. Please do go, and for the community, go onto the project website. There's an FAQ document there that's generated based on the questions, the common questions that have come in from the community and answers a lot of the key questions that, that folks have asked. We also appreciate staff um, being willing to post all of the comments that came in through the survey. So there's a 250-plus page PDF where you can see all the questions and comments that that people gave as well as the storyboard that gives that gives the background so and thank you mr chairman for giving us the time today thank you supervisor i walk shine mr chairman yeah just uh real briefly i want to um also thank the board for understanding uh that there needs to be some time here given to this the the abrupt change of events that we all have experienced i think most of us are still trying to wrap our heads around and that's engendered a lot of other questions and a reasonable expectation to understand now that we know these facts, what are the options ahead of us now? Because to me, the question of dredge versus not dredge uh, may be technically answered from the staff standpoint, but the question about what becomes of this park has been far from answered. 
and that's going to take some time. And I think, you know, the task force is absolutely essential to drilling down on what will become of this facility if we do not dredge it before we get to the point of discussing other other amenities. And, and that's going to take some time. And I just want to point out that, you know, we bring forward a board matter to to set up this task force that this will be a widely open, transparent process, that the task force meetings will be open to the general public. Uh, we expect this to be an ongoing dialogue, not a small group of people that go off in isolation and bring us another recommendation like we have here, but that this is you know, a task force, but it will also be engendering uh, community dialogue and uh, folks from the community will have ample opportunities uh, to participate in that. And then last um, but not least of, of immediate concern, because uh, I spent considerable time at, at Lake Akatink this weekend, and I know that in this year's budget, uh, should it be passed, um, we are including uh, funding to replace the playground out there. Um, I, I was a little bit alarmed when I saw people using it. Um, I know that it's closed. It's not safe. It's not properly roped off, um, and I'm worried um, about somebody getting hurt. Uh, coincident to that, um, I know there's been some chatter about people now that the silt has piled up in the lake, people traversing uh, out into the lake with maybe not a full understanding of the risks associated with that. So I would just say in the interim here, um, let's make sure we've addressed those liability and public information um, issues out there because uh, I, I was seeing things over the weekend that I think um, we wouldn't want to necessarily be encouraging. And so anything we can do to spread the word that this is a public park, it's open to the public, we want the public to come to it, we want them to enjoy it, but immediately we need to make sure that nobody gets hurt uh, out there and that we address those issues. Um, J. Cole, uh, safety is obviously our number one priority. We're going to change the fencing around there, and we're um, ASAP is what um, to get the elements removed so that there's not that um, hazard out there anymore. So we will get back to you and, and let you know when it's I appreciate um, done that. at every step, um, I, both I, you and Supervisor Walken. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and then lastly, you know, I'm anticipating this playground gets funded in this budget. Anything we can do to quickly expedite its replacement so that potentially maybe we don't have our kids that want to use this facility miss a whole nother summer. Uh, being able to use it, that would be appreciated as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I'm going to thank uh, Director Vosper, Executive Director Cole, Coordinator uh, Charles Smith, as well as our Director uh, Harrington for being here and speaking. And I think we know kind of what the next steps are based on the conversation we've had today. And with that, I just want to let the folks know that we will not be um, having time to do the bamboo ordinance, but we are going to go immediately to the private stormwater management facility uh, assistance uh, program. So if we could clear quickly and, and bring the next group in. Um, we have, again, till 3.30. Uh, I'm hoping that we can fully get this uh, presentation in before 3.30. And then we have also I wanted to do just a very brief couple-minute uh, presentation or at least a, a identification of where we are with the Green Bank um, Green Bank process. So with that, um, I know we have Chad Crawford here to present the, the local stormwater management assistance fund. Um, we have several stormwater management programs. I, I really asked uh, Chad to start with an overview of the different programs to identify the different programs through this through the slide deck that we, he's going to present. Hopefully this will make it easier to understand all the different components, if you will, of our, of our stormwater management program. And with that, if you're ready, uh, Mr. Crawford. And I'll start. Good afternoon. This is Ellie Cotting, Deputy Sorry, Director Ellie. for Public Works. And we do have a five-minute version of this presentation if you want to try and keep the bamboo people. So Chad will proceed with I'm, the five-minute I'm very minute. of doing that because it's such a it's, – there's so many different programs okay. to this. So if you could maybe just let people read the slide and just – highlight a couple pieces on them and then go through it that way. Uh, if people don't have the slides, they will already have seen the slides because they would have gotten that ahead of time. And that will give, give us a chance to do both, uh, speed up the presentation but still give folks a chance to hear any particular comments or issues that you wanted to make sure we understood. Good afternoon. I'm Chad Crawford. I'm the Director of Maintenance and Stormwater Management Division. <clears throat> We're here today to give you two updates and a recommendation 
for the creation of a stormwater fund. I will be brief, and you can stop me at any time. These are the three programs we'll be discussing today. The first is the CAP VCAP program. I have slides on the ongoing private to public uh, pilot, and we have a recommendation that the board approve and move forward with the creation of a maintenance grant program. The CAP VCAP program is an existing program, a cost share program where the project owner may receive financial and technical assistance to do water quality or energy um, efficiency retrofits. The Northern Virginia Soil Water Conservation District administers this program and I understand it's going well. Thus, we're proposing that we model the proposed maintenance, agree maintenance grant program after it. The private to public um, pilot, since 2017 we moved forward with the private to public program where we entered four different locations in the county into this program. Um, some privately maintained ponds can apply to, uh, pri for county maintenance, and these efforts are taking time. I have more slides on this. For the private to public program, the cost of rehabbing a facility is prorated based on the amount of area draining to the pond that's off-site and on-site for the community. I realize the text is small on this. The pilot status is shown on a slide. It encompasses four communities, and since 2017, two are complete and two are incomplete. It, it's been complex. It's taken a lot of time and awful, often required significant capital investment. Our next step with the private to public is to complete the transition for the two outstanding ponds to the county's maintenance program. Should the board want to continue this program, roughly 175 ponds might be eligible as currently envisioned. We estimate the total capital cost of all 175 coming into the county's maintenance to be 75 million just for the initial part. There would also be an increase in county operation maintenance cost, which is not shown. And there would be a need for additional staff to not only implement the program, but to maintain the facilities once they're in the, the county maintenance. Slide number eight is the proposed maintenance grant. This slide outlines the proposed maintenance grant program as recommended. Giving you all a moment to read it, are there any questions on, on this slide? I just if you, Scott, you just I would say just keep continuing and we will at the end. Okay, folks will. Sure. I'm going to move forward to the next slide. Questions. As there was some interest in having a comparison, we provided a comparison of the three different programs that we discussed uh, so far today: the VCAP CAP program, the private to public maintenance transfer program, and the proposed maintenance grant program. On this slide, it, it speaks for itself. Lastly. Our recommendation at the board approves us to move forward with the proposed local stormwater management fund, or grant, as I've referred to it, with the creation of a local stormwater management fund under Appendix O of the county code, and to establish a private stormwater maintenance assistance grant program to implement it with initial funding proposed at 250000 Okay, thank you, Ms. Crawford, and we'll start with... Uh, Supervisor Palachuk. Sure, thank you. And I know we're short on time. Really appreciate the presentation. Um, and I have to say, um, though it doesn't seem this large, that the Virginia Center Pond, uh, Center Pond Project uh, is beautiful, successful. I think it's been a great project, but I know that it's taken quite a bit of time and staff resources. So, um, you know, I think my only question is if we feel that we will get the same or better quality for the grant program, I, I think um, looking at the amount of time that was spent on just one and is still not finished, um, I think it makes sense to uh, have more of the the fund program. It does seem that the private to 
public um, transfer uh, is quite onerous and maybe not, as we're talking about investments, the best use of our county investments. But I guess I just, my only question is that is, do we feel that we can get that similar quality? Your, your teams have done an excellent job then. Ellie Cotting, Deputy Director for Public Works. So they're entirely different because the maintenance grant program will allow private owners to take responsibility and do the maintenance in accordance with their desires, their community's desires, and then there would be a cost share on the maintenance side. Whereas, to your point, the county took on the project for a very large lake, so the majority of the facilities um, that would be eligible for this program are going to be smaller. The also. smaller facilities, okay. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm comfortable with... I guess today's quick meeting, getting more information, but I think we should definitely look at that the cost share and the, the grant program. But would love more information as a follow-up. Thank you, Supervisor Palachuk. I'm going to turn to the chairman, then I'll come back to Supervisor Gross. Yeah, I just wanted to be clear. The um, private to public pilot, um, obviously the grant program is separate uh, from that, but the the, the actual transfer then, are we saying we're abandoning that? Or are we just saying that that has to be parked and considered separately from the grant program? Because I get the, I understand the grant piece on the shared maintenance, but I also know for the longest time we were talking about transferring some private ponds to the county in perpetuity should certain conditions be met. What is the status of that piece of it and how does it relate to what is being presented here? So, so the Private to public program and, and the grant program are mutually exclusive. The private to public program is underway with two of the four projects completed, two are outstanding, and there's still some homework the staff need to do to make a recommendation one way or the other. And so we propose to complete that pilot and come back to the board with our recommendation at some future date. And we don't know what the timeline is on that at this point. We're hopeful this next year the three of the four will be done. The third one is being queued up now for construction. The fourth one is still at the very beginning stages of, of it. Um, we may wind up, depending on where the third one goes, cutting our losses on the fourth and come back without completing it. And they're uniquely different, though? I mean, in other words, if you didn't do the fourth one, you're still, you feel like you can gather enough information from the process for the first three of the pilot to make a recommendation to us whether or not we should proceed any further with that. I, I believe so. I believe there will be adequate information to make a recommendation. And just last question, are there ones in the queue, like for ones that have come up since our pilot began, are we keeping a running list of interest across the county in this program? Yes, so yes. Do we have any idea what that order of magnitude is, how many might be in the queue? I'm, I'm estimating at this time less than a dozen. Okay. I can get you an actual number, though. I think just an update to us with, and understand, you know, especially once you make the decision about the fourth or not, because this particular, you know, private to public program, we've been talking about a lot of years, and we've got to, you know, we really, and I understand why this is important to look at and, and to understand all the pros and cons of it, but at some point we've really got to either get serious about putting this program in place, you know, in other parts of the county, or if the recommendation is for whatever reason we shouldn't continue to do it, we need to understand that uh, probably sooner rather than later. That notwithstanding, I mean, I certainly fully support the, the budget amount that's in here for the grant program because I think that is a different target audience and we want to get both audiences accommodated. Um, but the, pub the private to public one is one that we, we really probably just need to bring to a close so that we know what we're doing moving forward sooner rather than later. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Supervisor Gross and then Supervisor Musk. Thank you. And um, where is the money coming from on this? Is this from our stormwater? This would be from the stormwater uh, tax, yes. We already have hundreds of millions of dollars of um, un, un, incompleted um, uh, needs. So you think that this would, I guess it's 250000 is the initial. I'm, I'm concerned about, you know, the fact that we've got a lot of, everybody is paying the stormwater fee, which took us, oh golly, I think nine years to even implement a stormwater fee. Um, and so I'm, I'm really concerned about how this is going to be used because we have so many projects that are not these. 
So I think we need a little bit more information. Maybe we could get that list again of, of all the, the, the projects that would, we would like to see done under the stormwater fee. But one of the, um, one of the groups I want to make sure, this is open to houses of worship. Houses of worship generally are tax exempt, but I believe they do pay the stormwater fee. Is that correct? Houses of worship do not pay into the stormwater fee at this they time. They do not pay 